All right, on the uh, 28th of November in 1965, while flying a combat mission uh, to destroy a bridge that was part of a supply route, the plane that was piloted by Navy Captain Howard Rutledge was hit by anti-aircraft fire, which caused his plane to go into an uncontrollable uh, unrecoverable spin. Uh, he ejected from his doomed aircraft, but as soon as his parachute touched the ground, he was, he was immediately captured by a local militia. And that was the beginning of seven and a half years of Captain Rutledge being a prisoner of war. He was bound and gagged by members of the local militia. He then put in the back of a, of a truck and he was driven to Hanoi where he was placed in cell number two of the Heartbreak Hotel. Uh, that was one of the many cell blocks in a prison complex that American POWs nicknamed the Hanoi Hilton. In his book that he wrote called In the Presence of Mine Enemies, Rutledge described his imprisonment in pretty graphic language Here's what he said. He said, when the door slammed and the key turned in that rusty iron lock, a feeling of utter loneliness swept over me. I laid down on the cold cement slab in my six by six prison. The smell of human excrement burned my nostrils. The walls and the floors were caked with filth. Bars covered a tiny window high above the door. It is hard to describe what solitary confinement can do to a man. You quickly tire of standing or sitting down, sleeping or being awake. There are no books, no papers, no pencils, no magazines. The only colors that you see are drab gray and dirty brown. You do not see the sunrise or the moon, green grass or flowers. You are locked in, alone and silent in your filthy little cell, breathing stale, rotten air and trying somehow to keep your sanity intact. Shortly after his release on the 12th of February in 1973, while giving his while giving his testimony at the First Baptist Church in Claremont, California, Rutledge made this statement. He said, I was able to sustain life and hope through the faith I have in God. And when we hear about a believer in Jesus Christ going through such a, such a trying time as being a prisoner of war with all of the the torture that was inflicted upon him and, and, and all of the other things that they had to endure. Uh, when, when we hear about a believer in Christ going through something like that, sometimes, sometimes we ask the question, why, why would God allow such a thing to happen? Uh, wh why would God allow a Christian to face such hard times and such difficult circumstances so that they come to the very edge of losing their sanity. Why, why would God allow that? Why would God allow that? Well, I'm sure that the same question probably came to the mind of Joseph. The same question probably came to the mind of Joseph. You remember Joseph was, was favored by his father, and, and he was hated by his brothers. And, and remember Joseph was then sold to merchants, who carried him down as a slave into Egypt, where he was then sold again uh, to a fellow by the name of Potiphar. And, and some would think, some would think that in view of all of these difficulties that Joseph was experiencing, uh, some would think that the Lord God had abandoned Joseph, that the Lord God had abandoned him. But you remember even in the house of Potiphar, uh, Genesis chapter 39, verse 2 and verse 3, even in Potiphar's house, the Lord God was with Joseph. Uh, 
and, and blessed everything that Joseph did. And, and so it's not surprising to find that, that Potiphar in Genesis chapter 39, verse 6, uh, Potiphar actually entrusted everything that he had into the hand of Joseph because God was with him. But then you remember trouble came. Mrs. Potiphar uh, tried to seduce him. And when Joseph rejected her advances, you, you know the old saying, uh, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And so when Joseph rejected her advances, he was, she was filled with a rage and she brought a false accusation against him that resulted in Joseph being put into prison. But even in the prison house, Genesis chapter 39, verse 21 and verse number 22, even in the prison house, the Lord God was with Joseph. He had not abandoned him. The Lord God was with him. And not only that, the Lord God blessed him so that everything he did prospered. And as a result, the prison warden put everything into the hands of Joseph so that the Bible says everything that was done in the prison house, it was Joseph who did it. It was Joseph who did it. And so therefore, when Pharaoh's uh, chief butler and when his chief baker in Genesis chapter 40, verse one, down to verse number four, when they had somehow offended the Pharaoh and, and were put into the prison, uh, they were entrusted to the care of Joseph. And you remember the story how that there came the day when Joseph came into the prison. He saw, he saw the chief butler. He saw the chief baker. He saw that, that they were very sad. Their countenance was very sad. And, and so when he asked them why, uh, both of them said that they had dreamed a troubling dream. They, they, they couldn't understand what it all meant. And so they were troubled by the dream that they had dreamed. But, but you remember it was at that point that then Joseph said, in Genesis chapter 40, verse 8, Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And so they told their dreams to Joseph. And after hearing the dreams, Joseph then gave them the interpretation. He told them exactly what their dreams meant. For the butler, in, in Genesis 40, verse 9 to verse number 13, uh, Joseph told the chief butler that in three days, his head would be lifted up and he would be restored to his position of serving in Pharaoh's palace. In three days, he would be released from the prison and restored to his place of service. The baker on the other hand, Genesis chapter 40, verse 16 to verse 19, uh, the baker was told that in three days, his head would also be lifted up, but it would not be lifted up and restored to a place of service. His head would be lifted up off of his body and his dead body would be hung on a tree and it would be eaten by the birds. And sure enough, three days later, on Pharaoh's birthday, Genesis chapter 40, verse 20 to verse 22, on Pharaoh's birthday, part of the celebration was that the words of Joseph were literally fulfilled. The, the baker was, was killed and his body was hung on a tree, but the butler, he was restored to his position. But then on top of the difficulties and the hardships that Joseph faced, at this up to this point in the story, there, there also came another day of very bitter disappointment. You remember when, when the butler was told that he would be restored to his place of service in Pharaoh's house, uh, Genesis 14, uh, uh, chapter 40, verse 14 and verse 15, uh, Joseph asked him to speak to, to Pharaoh on his behalf, uh, to explain to Pharaoh that he he was, he was from a foreign country. He had been unjustly condemned and, and that he would go to Pharaoh on his behalf. But instead of, instead of remembering Joseph, verse number 23 tells us uh, the chief butler forgot about him until two years later, Pharaoh himself had a dream. 
that needed an interpretation. Now, now from this story, from this story, and I, and I know that, that you're familiar with it, but, but from this story and the circumstances that surround it, I want to mention to you uh, just very quickly four reasons why God allows problems to come into our lives. Four reasons why God allows us to face difficult times, discouraging times, just like Joseph did. Why does God allow that? Why does sometimes it seems like he brings us to the very edge of our sanity? We feel like we're about to lose our minds. Why does God allow that? Why does he allow the problems? Well, let me give you four reasons. First of all, God allows problems to come into our lives simply because of the fact that the problems provide opportunities. Problems provide opportunities. You, you see, when we are faced with problems, we will normally allow self-pity to kick in so that we become so focused on the problem that we fail to look for the possibilities that are there. We, we become so focused on the difficulty that we fail to see the opportunities. And, 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 and by the way, we, we ought to stop and consider an important point. And the important point we ought to consider is this. H have you ever noticed how many good things have come out of prisons? H have you ever noticed that? I mean, think about it. There's a whole section in your Bible, and it's called the prison epistles. These are, these are epistles that were written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison. And, and the purpose of those epistles was to give encouragement and to give instruction, not only to local churches, but also to leaders, to individuals that he was acquainted with. Uh, out of the prison came these wonderful epistles that are still a blessing and a source of help for us today. Yeah, they all came out of a prison. Uh, there's another book that we find in the Bible called the book of the Revelation. You remember it was written by the apostle John while he was in exile. In other words, he was in prison on the island of Patmos. And, and from that prison experience, we have that wonderful book of Revelation, <coughs> excuse me, which tells us of those things that are, that are yet to come. Uh, more recently, John Bunyan, you remember, from a prison cell in Bedford, England. He wrote that great Christian classic entitled Pilgrim's Progress. And if you've never read that, I would encourage you to do so. But he wrote that great, that great classic uh, from a prison cell. And, and there's many other examples that could be given. But you get the idea. Uh, being in a literal prison or... Being imprisoned in a time of trouble, being imprisoned in a time of difficulties can truly open for us doors of opportunity. You see, when Joseph was about 17 years old, Genesis 37 tells us, when he was about 17 years old, God had told Joseph through a, through a series of dreams that he was destined for greatness in fact, he would become a great ruler, even uh, become such a great ruler that, that even his own family would come and bow down before him. But, but Joseph did not know that that path to greatness would lead him through a prison. He did not know that that would happen. In 1972, a fellow by the name of Charles Chuck Colson was special counsel to President Richard Nixon. And at that time, he was considered to be one of the most powerful men in America. He was known as the hatchet man in Nixon's administration because of the fact that he had a reputation for getting things done no matter what the cost. Before he was sentenced to serve time in prison for his part in what has become known as the Watergate scandal, as his world was falling apart, uh, falling apart around him, uh, Colson uh, actually came to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And in his testimony, he said this, 
He said, my lowest days as a Christian have been far more fulfilling and rewarding to me than all the days of glory in the White House. It was in prison that I learned to know God and to walk with God. But that's not all. It was during his time in prison that Colson, he actually caught a vision for founding what has become known as the Prison Fellowship that has resulted in thousands of prisoners in, in America and even around the world. Thousands of prisoners who have come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and have had their lives transformed by the power of of the gospel. Here's the point I want you to get. When you find yourself in a prison house of trouble, when you find yourself in a prison that is surrounding you and stifling you with all kinds of problems, be careful that you do not miss the fact that God is doing something in your life. He has put you in a place. He has put you in a situation where you do not want to be in order that he might prepare you for something greater. Problems, problems, they provide opportunities. There's another thing that I want us to notice about problems. God allows problems because, number two, they promote maturity. They promote maturity. You, you remember David was a man after God's own heart. We find that in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. But you remember David, even though he was a man after God's own heart, he, he had his terrible time of failure. You, you remember he was, that, he was that one who was guilty of not only committing adultery, he was the one who was guilty of trying to cover up his adultery by committing murder. That, that was David. But in Joseph, it's interesting that we don't find any record. We find no record of any failure any moral failure, any spiritual failure. There's, there's no record that we find of him doing anything that was wrong. But even though his life was pure, Joseph was not ready to step into the palace and into the place that God had in mind for him. Now, I, 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 don't, want to be, uh, I don't want to be unkind, and I don't want to be overly critical, but, but just to put it very bluntly, uh, Joseph's early life, as you read the biblical record, his life in his early days had basically been a life that was, that was very soft, uh, pampered, uh, spoiled. Uh, he was a daddy's boy. While the brothers were out working, he was many times, he was still at home still at home. As the firstborn, you remember, the firstborn of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, uh, Joseph was the favored son. In fact, the Bible says in Genesis 37, verse 3 and verse 4, it says, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Therefore, one writer said it very well when he, when he noted, if God was going to use Joseph, listen carefully, if God was going to use Joseph, he would have to toughen him up. His life has been too soft. It's been too easy. If God is going to use him in a great way, then he's going to have to toughen him up. He would have to make him ready to be prime minister of Egypt during a worldwide famine. And you know what? That's exactly what the psalmist talks about. Listen to what the psalmist said. Psalm 105, verse 17, verse 18. He sent a man before them, even Joseph who was sold for a servant. Uh, that, that's referring to the fact that he was sold into the house of Potiphar as a servant. But that wasn't the end of it. That wasn't the end of it. We find in verse 18 that also his feet, they hurt 
with fetters. That is, he's locked up in the prison house. And as a result of that, notice it, he was laid in iron. In, in other words, the idea here is simply that while he's in that prison house and, and while he's locked up in the fetters, that, that literally iron strength entered into his soul. Charles Spurgeon, I think, said it very well. Here's what he said. He said, the iron fetters were preparing him to wear chains of gold and making his feet ready to stand in high places. Bottom line, when Joseph went to prison, iron entered into his soul so that when he came out of the prison, he was a iron-souled man. He was a man of, uh, of wisdom, a man of courage, a man of determination, and, and he conducted himself every bit like a born leader there in the land of Egypt. One commentator noted it this way, when Joseph ascended to the high place of government by himself, he carried a nation. Think about it. He carried a nation that was foreign to him through a terrible famine without one single sign of revolt. And the reason was because he had been prepared for the hardships of the famine when he experienced the hardships of the prison. Now, let me just tell you today, God wants, he wants men. God wants women. In fact, can I get real personal? He wants every one of us. He wants us not to be spiritual jellyfish. He wants us to be men. He wants us to be women who have a iron soul. They have a backbone that will not bend to the ways of the world. They have a backbone that will stand strong and straight for God in a day of rampant compromise. That's what God desires. And the only way, the only way to get iron into our souls is when we go through those prison times of trouble, the prison times of hardship, the prison times of disappointment. That's what hardens us and makes us able to stand. And that's why the Apostle Paul, that's why the Apostle Paul said, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and verse 10, he said unto me, this is God speaking to the Apostle Paul when he was praying that that thorn in the flesh would be taken away. He said, my grace, this is God speaking, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, Paul says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather suffer in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches in necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. Why? And here's the reason. Because when I am weak, then am I strong. Bottom line is simply this. God allows us to go through the prison times of trouble so that we might grow up and become more mature spiritually. When God puts people in the prison house to mature them, we need to be careful that we do not rescue them from the process. That, that's an important point that I want you to remember. When God puts people in the prison house of trouble, disappointment, discouragement, whatever it may be, when God puts people in the prison house, we need to be very careful that we do not rescue them from the process. Now, as, as a parent and as a grandparent, when, when my boys are facing hard times, uh, when my grandsons, my grandchildren are facing hard times, there is a, uh, there, if, if there's some way, if there's some way that I can make their life easier. If there's some way I can step in, relieve them of their problem, help them in their difficulty, make their life to be better. I want to do it. I want to do it. And, and, and it's interesting that we find the very same thing happened in the life of Joseph. You, you remember when Joseph's brothers wanted to kill him? 
They, they, they made their, they saw Joseph coming. They made their plan. They're going to kill him. And, and you remember it was Reuben, the, the firstborn. It was Reuben, uh, Genesis 37, verse 21 to verse 22. It was Reuben who actually saved Joseph's life. And, and, and his suggestion was simply, let's don't kill him. Let's just put him in this, in this dry pit. And of course, we find out from the context that in the mind of Reuben, his plan was that he would come back later and he would rescue Joseph out of that pit. You find that in chapter 37, verse number 29. But when he came back later to rescue Joseph, he found that Joseph had already been sold and Joseph is already on his way to Egypt. But let's, let's stop right there for just a minute. Let's suppose that Reuben had have succeeded. Let, let's suppose that Reuben had have managed to rescue Joseph. Do, do you realize the implications of that? Had, had Reuben succeeded in rescuing Joseph from his prism of trouble? Had he succeeded in that, then Joseph would have never been found in Pharaoh's palace. He would have never been found in Pharaoh's palace. That, that is, if the Lord God had allowed Reuben to rescue Joseph, then Joseph would never have been able to say the words that we find spoken to his brothers in Genesis chapter 50 and verse number 20. As for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people. By the way, much people. You know what that included? That included all of Joseph's family. That included the families of his brothers. That, that included not only his own personal relatives, but it included the Egyptians. It included the people from all of those nations surrounding Egypt who came to Egypt to buy food from Joseph. Yeah, it was the fact that God had sent him to that place that many people were saved alive. The bottom line is problems are there for God's purposes. Problems are the avenues that God uses to bring us from where we were to where we need to be. And in the process, in the process, God fires our soul with steel so that we can stand, so that we can stand strong in the face of the challenges that are ahead. Problems provide opportunities. Uh, problems promote maturity. And then I want you to notice a third thing. God allows problems to come into our lives because it is the problems that will prove our integrity. Problems proves integrity. One, one of the things about Joseph that is interesting is that no matter where you find him, no, no matter what you find happening in his life, Joseph never changed. He was consistent. Joseph was just Joseph regardless of the circumstances. In every situation, whether he was in a pit or whether he was in a prison or whether he was standing in Pharaoh's palace, Joseph maintained his integrity and his loyal faithfulness to the Lord God. You see, Joseph understood. Joseph understood that circumstances do not make us what we are. Circumstances do not make us what we are. Rather, circumstances simply reveal what we are. That is, as we are going through times of trouble, we're going through problems, we are giving to everyone around us an opportunity to see what is really going on on the inside. It allows others to see what we really are, not what we say we are, but what we really are on the inside. Someone has well said this, people never know. They never know you as well as they know you when they watch you go through a difficult time in your life. They never know you as well as they know you and when they are watching you go through a difficult time. So problems provide opportunities. They, they, they promote maturity. They, they prove our integrity. And, and, and then last of all, very quickly notice this one. Uh, when we're going through problems, 
problems produce dependency. You remember we mentioned it before. While, while Joseph was in Potiphar's house, in Genesis 39, verse 2 and verse 3, he, he learned, he learned from his own personal experiences there that it was the Lord God who was with him, and it was the Lord God who made everything that he did to prosper. And therefore, in that difficult place, he learned, I can depend on God. Yeah, I can depend on him. He is always faithful. Uh, again, in Pharaoh's prison house, in, 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 in Genesis 39, verse 21, and verse number 22, Joseph learned again, it was, it was the Lord God who was with him. It, it was the Lord God who, who blessed him and made everything he did uh, to prosper. And, and again, it was in that prison house, just like in Potiphar's house, Joseph again learns the wonderful truth that he could depend, he could depend on the Lord God. Bottom line, it was during the difficult times Joseph learned that great important lesson that all of us need to learn. And that is the lesson that we can always count on God. We can always depend on God in every circumstance that we face. And, and the reason is simply because, as the Bible says, Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse number nine, the Lord thy God. He is God. The, notice it, he is the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments. The wonderful, the wonderful thing to know that our God is a faithful God and that we can depend on him. And, and it's that wonderful truth that I'm sure was in the mind of Ron Hamilton, when, when he wrote the words to that song that many times we will sing together, always the same, oh, praise his name. Jesus never changes. He's always the same. Always together, his love is forever. Jesus never changes. He's always the same. When we find ourselves going through a time of trouble, we find ourselves locked up in a prison house of hardship and suffering. Satan will always come along with the temptation, wanting us to just give up. He's, he comes along with the temptation to, to just give up, to allow, to allow the circumstances that we're going through to overwhelm us, to discourage us to destroy us. Satan will come along and he'll do that. But when those hard circumstances and when those hard problems come into our lives, let, let's not try to run from them. Let, let's embrace them. Let, let's turn them over to the Lord. Let's keep our eyes on the possibilities of service that God has for you today and keep our eyes open for the eternal glory that God has in store for all of those who will faithfully love him and serve him regardless of the difficulties that they face in their life. Problems. Yeah, they come to all of us, but we don't have to be defeated by them. We can be victorious because we serve a faithful